We are in the middle of our series in Ephesians called To Unite All Things, and we've been really focused around that concept, which comes from chapter one, where Paul said that in Christ, God is uniting things in heaven and things on earth. And we've been talking about how the things that are united in heaven, these things that were meant to be together in the beginning, but were torn apart by sin and rebellion, are being brought together. And the things in heaven that are brought together have an impact on earth and vice versa. And today, when we look at chapter three, we're actually going to see one of the most dramatic examples of of how that coming together er, on earth impacts the heavens in an incredible, incredible way. It's also kind of the turning point of the book. Ephesians is in two fairly distinct halves. The first half is very cosmic and theological and big picture macro level stuff. And the second half, Paul begins to zoom in closer and closer just to the the details of everyday life. But but the mistake that can be made there and that we really don't want you guys to fall into with this book is people think that those two halves aren't related to each other, that it's like theology and then everyday life stuff. But we hope you'll see as we go through this, because we'll begin to a little bit today, these practical things that Paul will tell us about life flow directly from the big picture theological things. So last week we finished up chapter two. The first half was about the fact that we before Jesus were dead, but God in Christ has raised us back to life with him. And then the second half of chapter two kind of mirrored the first part, but it said this time that those of us who were Gentiles, meaning everyone who's not ethnically Jewish, was far from God. We were cut off from God, hopeless, without any way of getting to him, but in Christ we have been brought near. Now in chapter three, which we're gonna look at today, Paul is going to just like zoom way in on that idea of the Jew-Gentile bringing together, the uniting of the peoples with Israel. And this is something that for us can be really hard to connect to because honestly, it's just like it's not something that modern Christians think about very much. I mean, how many of you guys can remember the last time you as a Christian thought, wow, how is it that I, as a non-Jewish person, have been brought into the, the spiritual heritage of Israel? Anybody wake up this morning with that burning question? that we had to figure out? We don't ask that question, but here's the thing. That was the question of the early church. That was the most deeply significant question they had to answer. It's why so much of the New Testament talks about that specifically. And so today, I think we're going to get just this uh, incredible example from Paul of why it actually does matter, even though we don't think about it. If we understand God's intention for the nations correctly, I think it'll reframe the way we see the church, the way we understand the role and purpose of the church. And this entire passage is just a powerful example of that. So let's jump in. (coughs) Ephesians 3. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. Pause there. This is the first time Paul is explicitly calling himself a prisoner in this letter. And he is literally a prisoner while he's writing this letter. But whose prison is he in? Anybody know? Rome. Rome. So he's a prisoner technically of Rome or of Caesar. But what Paul says about his imprisonment reveals so much about how he sees the world and who's actually in charge. Because he's sitting in Roman chains in a Roman prison saying, I am a prisoner of the Messiah, Jesus. It's incredible. It's a powerful moment. He goes, I'm not a a prisoner to Rome. I'm a prisoner to Jesus. He's the one who's in control of me and my life. And he says he's a prisoner on behalf of the Gentiles which is literally true because it's his message about the Gentiles that that got the attention of the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem and got him arrested. But it's also true in this bigger picture sense of what his mission is, that he's here because of the purpose and plan that God had from the beginning for the Gentiles. And when he's talking about that plan, he uses this word mystery three times. And it's kind of a a little bit misleading of a word. It's the only way to translate that Greek word because the Greek word is literally mysterion. It's where we get our English word mystery from. But the the Greek word and English word have some really significant differences. In English, when we say mystery, we always mean something that is hidden, something that has yet to be uncovered, something we don't know and, and have to figure out. That's like what mystery movies and novels and everything are about. In Greek, mysterion can and usually does mean something that used to be hidden, that used to be unknown, but has been revealed. So it's something we didn't know, but now we do. And that's exactly what Paul's doing. He actually says it really clearly. He says, this is a mysterion of the Messiah. That's what Christ means. 
which wasn't made known in past generations, but now, because of the Spirit, through the apostles like me, it's been made known. And he says, that mysterion is that non-Jewish peoples, people who are not ethnically connected to the family of Abraham, are fellow heirs alongside of them, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise. Now that belief is exactly what got Paul thrown in prison and eventually got him killed. I mean, it's that controversial in the first century Jewish world to say, no, what Jesus did was actually accomplish enough to bring all of the nations into the promise of Abraham. It wasn't just for Israel. He's, he has opened the floodgates for everyone. And again, so controversial that it gets Paul thrown in prison and eventually executed. But if you are looking for it, if you know what to look for, and honestly, just if your eyes are even open as you read, this is all over the Old Testament. And that's built right into the meaning of Mysterion, that it was there, but it's been revealed. At the very beginning of the story, Genesis 1, 2, and 3, where most of us will be fairly familiar with, Genesis 3 talks about the fall of humanity, where Adam and Eve choose to kind of elevate themselves to the place of God to try to become like God. And then Genesis 3 through 11 is kind of the next major section that, de- that shows the, the unraveling or the downward spiral of that sin and how it spreads out to affect the rest of humanity. So in that section, it's a super dark section of scripture. You get stories like Cain and Abel. You get stories like Noah and the great flood. Um, and you get the story that we're going to look at right now, which takes place in Genesis 11. And it's the story of, of collective humanity coming together to do the exact same thing that Adam and Eve did. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth." So humanity has this this sense of unity. They speak the same language and they come together and what they decide to do is build a tower. And we're predisposed to kind of picture like a medieval tower or a castle or something like that, but that's not what you should be picturing. In the ancient Near East, the only buildings that were towers were palaces and more commonly temples. And towers were always ziggurats, which are those buildings that have staircases going around the outside of them. We associate really similar buildings with uh, the Aztecs and Mayans. You know what I'm talking about? They're kind of like staircase towers, and they were temples. So the author of Genesis is assuming that you know that what they're building is a temple. And so what's revealed is collective humanity coming together uses all of their technology and ingenuity and hard work to build a temple to themselves trying to literally and figuratively put themselves in the place of God by building a temple to the heavens for their own name. It's all of humanity coming together to do the exact same thing that Adam and Eve did. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower. I I just love, by the way, that they built the tallest tower humanity was capable of building and God still has to come down to it. Have you ever noticed that? (laughs) which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, behold, they are one people and they all have one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of the earth. And from there, the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. Now, there's Hebrew wordplay here that happens to also work as a pun in English, which is nice, because it says that he, God, balaled Babel, which is confused Babel. And so it gets translated Babel here just to kind of preserve that pun, because Babel in English also happens to be a word that means confused language, right? The problem is it actually, this is kind of a side note that doesn't have a whole lot to do with today, but it's worth noting. Um, That word Bavel that's translated Babel, that's used over 250 times in the Old Testament. And this is the only place where we translate it Babel. Anybody know what it's actually meant? Yeah, Babylon, nice. Tell me you remember that from the Isaiah series. Yes. (laughs) That's all I care about today. Like, I don't care who wins. 
We win. Um, so the reason that's significant is because this is telling the story of the formation of Babylon. And so for the rest of the Bible, that image of Babylon should evoke the idea of what happens when all of humanity comes together to do their best to exalt themselves to the place of God. And so what God does is he takes that, that united force of anti-God humanity and he scatters them and they fragment into untold pieces in different nations. And that's what the rest of chapter 11 describes is that kind of spreading out of different nations. One thing that's really important to note, um, I'm going to say the word nations a bunch of times today, and, and the Bible says the word nations a lot also. And it's really important for us to retrain ourselves as we're reading scripture, that when you see the word nations, don't think of a modern politically defined nation state. Like, you know, like America or Nigeria or uh, Cambodia or any other country that we think of as a nation. That's a very, very recent idea. In the Old Testament, goyim, in the New Testament, ethnos, they get translated nation, but they mean people. They mean people group. They mean a unique people group defined by their ethnic identity and their language and stuff like that. And so in a country like Tanzania in East Africa, that's a nation in the modern sense, but within that nation, there are hundreds, if not thousands of nations in the sense of what the Bible means. Does that make sense? It's very significant because we, when we think nations, we're, we're talking about a, a brand new idea in the eyes of history. And when the Bible talks about nations, it means the various peoples that have scattered and spread. And so there's this fragmentation of humanity into all of these different parts. And alongside that, there's a, a mysterious spiritual reality kind of looming over that. It's, it's something that Moses actually indicates in the book of Deuteronomy, but it's the idea that at the same time that these rebellious people scatter, it's almost like placed over them are these different spiritual powers that are also in rebellion against God and that begin to kind of work in concert with human rebellion in order to be against God and God's will. So you have this kind of spreading out fragmentation of people and this kind of ownership or influence over them of spiritual powers. And it doesn't like suddenly get good between the peoples. In fact, it's never been good. And you see this just in like our, our regular everyday life. We are like built for tribal thinking. We're like designed to draw lines and pick teams and kind of set ourselves in opposition to other teams. The example that comes to mind for me that's like, hopefully relatable for most of you, is just think about your high school at lunchtime. You guys know what I'm talking about? Or was Gilroy High the only place where like you looked out and there were just different factions that did not overlap at all? So in Gilroy, in Gilroy High in the early 2000s, it's like you go out on the quad at lunch and it's like there are the cool jocks and there are the skaters and there are the stoners and there's this weird contingent of cowboys that Gilroy High always had. <laughs> and there's like... There's the weird small group of Christians that I was a part of. I actually see uh, Bobby over there. He's part of that also. Um, that was 50% of the group. <laughs> and, and I feel like I got like an, an extra kind of insight into that because I was actually homeschooled up until my junior year of high school. I know, super surprising that I was homeschooled, right? <laughs> totally don't seem like that at all. So I was, I was a part of different co-ops and, and much smaller groups of peers. But when I went to Gilroy High, it's like night and day. There were 2,000 students there when I went there. So I walked out at lunch, and, and I had friends who were friends from church. I had friends who were friends from swimming and water polo. Um, and all of them went to Gilroy High. And like in different contexts, we were all just friends together. But you'd go outside at Gilroy High and be like, oh, I can't hang out with my normal friends. Like I have to pick which group I'm going to be a part of. I remember one time, this is a true story, like I had to go ask a question from one of my water polo friends who was like a genuine friend when we played water polo, but he was, like, it was to leave my group and cross the quad and go into Jockville <laughs> and ask the, my, my friend a question felt like, a, like I was a diplomat from a foreign nation or something. <laughs> like I walked into the group and was like, like do I bow? What, how do I like, <laughs> what do I... And that's, that's high school, and that's relatively harmless, but, but that same impulse that causes us to kind of group up and set ourselves in opposition to other groups grows and expands and becomes increasingly harmful. And so the most dramatic example in our current life is the political situation right now. I mean, how many of you guys feel like you go on Facebook or Twitter or whatever and you just are not ever going to say anything? because you know how everyone's going to react to anything you say. Anybody feel like they're just, I'm just silent on there because who knows what could happen? What happens 
is you say one opinion that you have about one thing, and all of the various tribes and factions politically draw a million conclusions about you based on that one opinion, put you in the appropriate category, and then have a like, pre-written way of relating to you on the basis of the tribe that they now see that you're a part of. You guys know what I'm talking about? So I might have a nuanced set of opinions that, that kind of goes back and forth between political extremes, but if I say one opinion, a huge majority of people will go, okay, so he's that type of person. And for better or worse, that's who you are now, and that's how I relate to you. It's, it's exaggerated in social media, but it's how we are individually also. It's like God forbid that we have nuanced opinions or, or that we can interact and be friends in spite of some differences. And that same impulse that makes us group up in high school and that makes us kind of tribal with our politics, as it expands to the national level and the international level, it historically creates the horrors of violence, warfare, and eventually genocide, which is kind of the most extreme form of tribal behavior, right? Because that's where you decide who the other is, and then you try to systematically eliminate 100% of them. That's happened untold times throughout human history, way more than we could possibly know, because it goes back to before we started writing stuff down. But just in our recent memory, we have way too many examples, right? We have the incredibly famous example of the Holocaust, where in the 40s you had Nazi Germany decide that the Jewish people were the other and then attempt to systematically kill all of them to the tune of six million people dying. It's like, this is us, that's them, and we're going to kill them all. But there are other genocides, man, that, that reveal the differences don't even have to be that dramatic for us to decide to kill each other. Just a couple decades before the Holocaust, there was the Armenian genocide in the Ottoman Empire where 1.5 million people were killed, and it's like, us as Westerners, wouldn't, we wouldn't even be able to really tell the ethnic differences between the people who were killing each other. And even more horrifically, and even more recently, in the 90s, there was the, the genocide in Rwanda. How many of you guys are familiar with that? In Rwanda, I think it's like three quarters of a million people died in 90 days in a very small area. And these are, they, they were the Hutus and the Tutsis, two Rwandan peoples, who had, as an outsider at least, the most minuscule of differences in their cultures and ethnicities. I mean, remarkably similar. But when the switch flips, neighbors killed neighbors for 90 days until almost a million people died. In the 70s, there's the example um, that I talked about a couple weeks ago, which is particularly close to me because I've been to this place a few times, I and mean, that's in Cambodia. There was the Khmer Rouge genocide, where a party known as the Khmer Rouge decided to wipe out um, not only people who weren't a like a just a little bit different from them, they were wiping out people who were ethnically identical to them. 25% of Cambodia was killed, two million people. And they were killed by other Cambodians. I'm talking zero ethnic difference. The only differences were ideological. It's just worldview differences, that's it and millions of people died. And if you go to Cambodia today, you, you can like feel how that fragmentation continues, because that was only a few decades ago. And so you've got people who are, you know, just living their life, and they might go to the market and shop for food right next to somebody who was a Khmer Rouge soldier who victimized their family 30 years ago. It's a mess. And the thing that we have to come to terms with is that it's the same impulse to fragmentation, to division, to tribalism that makes us do petty, small things. That's that same impulse that leads to warfare, murder, and genocide. And so the story of Scripture, and what Paul calls the mysterion, is that out of that fragmentation of peoples, God chooses one fragment, one family, family of Abraham, who becomes the people of Israel, and he says this nation will be my inheritance. But he doesn't just say, I'm going to keep these guys for myself, and I'm going to do a better job with them, and you guys can have everybody else, done deal, I've got Israel. Now, from the beginning, the mysterion is that he was planning to use that people to gather back in all peoples. And so in Genesis 12, which is literally the very next chapter after the Tower of Babylon story, he says, this is a promise to Abraham, I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. 
I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. I mean, it seems so incredibly clear, doesn't it? I'm not just going to bless you so you can have better stuff than everybody else. I'm going to bless you so that you can be a blessing to others. He says this to Abraham more than once. There's a really similar reiteration of the promise in Genesis 15 and then in Genesis 22. And it goes on and on throughout the rest of the story as Abraham's family expands into the nation of Israel. It's there in the Exodus. It's there in the giving of the law. If you want to see the most dramatic examples, it's in the Psalms. You start reading through the hymn book of Israel and you will find hundreds and hundreds of individual lines about how God is the king of all the peoples and that one day all the peoples will worship and serve him. Some of the most beautiful imagery about it's in the prophets. So you have things like Isaiah and Isaiah chapter two talking about how all the nations one day will stream uphill. It's like water is flowing in reverse. They're going to stream uphill to the temple, to the place where God's presence dwells. And all the nations will come together, bringing their best unique offerings to God. And that kind of image occurs all over the prophets. And so the expectation is always that God is somehow, through this one fragment, going to reunite all of them. And the thing that Paul is saying in this book, and that's all over the New Testament, is that that's exactly what Jesus accomplished. Last week in chapter 2, Paul said that Jesus, in his body on the cross, killed the hostility. And that's a really unusual way for us to think about the cross and the atonement. We're very comfortable with the idea of of, um, Jesus' death making it possible for us as individuals to come to God. And that's primary. That's primary. But Paul said it also killed the hostility between peoples and allowed them to come together. And so in Jesus, you have this one faithful Israelite, this offspring of Abraham, who does what is necessary to invite into that family all other peoples. After he's resurrected, he tells his disciples, I'm going to be with the Father, but the Spirit is coming. And it's going to empower you, and you're going to be my witnesses to all the nations. And so then after he's ascended to heaven, the followers of Jesus are gathered together in one place, and the Holy Spirit comes there like a rushing wind. It's actually almost like when the presence of God falls on the temple in the Old Testament. And they all start speaking different languages. And watch what happens. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. Very intentionally chosen wording. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. Do you see what Luke is doing? And they were amazed and astonished saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. Proselytes, by the way, being non-ethnically Jewish people who had converted to uh, Judaism religiously. Cretans and Arabians, and we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mockingly said, ah, they're just drunk. (laughs) They're filled with new wine. This is the reversing of Babel moment. You see this? Luke wants you to see that the same God who took people who were monolingual and spread them across the world is also the same God who is going to gather them back together in Jesus. He's going to undo the fragmentation. So instead of people who speak the same language suddenly not being able to understand each other, all of these people who speak different languages can understand in their own language the gospel. It's an incredible moment. And it's a beachhead. This is just the beginning. Because these are all Jews at this point who are hearing just in their different languages from all around. But when Jesus sends them out to the nations, this is the model. This is the vision. Babylon is undone. And unity is possible again, but on completely different terms than we had in Genesis chapter 11. And so Paul says, this is the mysterion, that Gentiles, non-Jewish ethnic peoples, are fellow heirs, members of the same body as Israel, and partakers of the promise in Messiah Jesus through the gospel. And he goes on to finish the section by kind of unpacking what that means and why that's happening. And this is where the dynamite is, in my opinion. 
He says, of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, the grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. You see how he finishes the same way he started to kind of close the section? He started by saying, I'm in prison for you, the Gentiles. And he ends by saying, I'm suffering for you, but don't, it's not for you to be in despair. This is your glory. And he says the eternal purpose was that all of us would have boldness and access to God through our faith in Jesus. But what he says at the beginning of the section, to the Western mind, to the modern mind, is just baffling. He says, the reason that I do this, the reason that I'm unveiling this plan, the reason that I'm out saying all of that I'm, that I'm saying is so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to rulers and authorities in heavenly places. Have you ever thought of the church's purpose like that before? Because I can tell you I haven't until this week. That word manifold is, is kind of a weird word. We don't really use that anymore. Um, the Greek word polypoikolos is a compound word that means many and face. So it means multifaceted or many faced. So you picture like a diamond that is part of its value is in all of the different faces, all the different facets that it has that reflect light differently. Or depending on the era that you grew up in, you might picture a disco ball, which is also very multifaceted. <laughs> he says, when the church is united... And specifically, when the church is united across ethnic gaps and divisions, the spiritual powers and principalities see that, and to them, the multifaceted wisdom of God is revealed. It's almost like the spiritual powers that have, have held sway over the nation since the Tower of Babylon are witnessing God take back what's his when the church is united. It's an unbelievable beautiful weight, privilege, responsibility. Because our world right now, our culture, is just like, we give so much lip service to the idea of unity and reconciliation between people of, of all different types. So pick your divide, whether it's ethnic, whether it's gender, socioeconomic, political, whatever. We give a lot of lip service to unity and reconciliation, but we're terrible at it and it isn't working at all. Can we agree on that? It's not working very well. If you need me to prove my point, your homework is turn on the news for 30 minutes. I don't care what network at any time this week and then come back and we'll talk. We're more divided than ever. I mean, that's so true that it's a stereotype to even say it. And it's because our culture has, broadly speaking, two approaches to this, and neither of them work. One is, is like a fake, forced homogeneity that pretends like there are no differences between us and that we should just all be exactly the same. And that doesn't work and isn't true. And then the other one, which is, is even more damaging and more prevalent on all sides of the political world, is to draw the lines deeper, make the tribalism more embedded, and then elevate and drop down different groups to whatever advantage you want. And all sides do this, by the way, and it doesn't work. The reason that the slide says unity in Jesus is because the only way for humanity to reconcile across these deep and ancient divides is to unite around something that supersedes those differences. And there is only one thing under heaven that does, and it's the risen Son of God, period. And so... Unity in the church does not ignore or homogenize or pretend like everything's exactly the same. In the church, we can see and value and understand and learn about the differences between us and our histories and our experiences, but rally around something that is infinitely transcendent beyond them. Say, no, there are differences, but man, they just wither and shrink back in the light of the Son of God, who is our King. And if we're serving Him, then we can serve alongside people who are drastically different from us. And Paul says, when that 
happens. It reverberates through the heavens, and angels and demons look and are in awe at God's wisdom. Let me show you what I'm talking about. This is a picture that I took in Cambodia in 2015. The guy having his feet washed, um, decades before this picture was taken, was a Khmer Rouge general. That means he was a general on the bad guy side of the genocide in Cambodia. Now he's a pastor, and he's having his feet washed at a conference by a young man who's also a pastor, who I promise you, because this is just how it works in Cambodia, I promise you, has lost family members to the Khmer Rouge genocide in the past. He's washing his feet. He's imitating the king who washes the feet of the people who don't deserve it. And there's no pretending like this, like there's no difference between these guys or like something horrible didn't happen. When I met the guy with glasses the day before this conference, he told me in tears about who he had been and what he had done. He still has immense shame and regret and guilt, but he's welcomed into the family of God so much so that this guy who probably has been feeling the effects of that kind of evil for decades, for his entire life, gets on his knees and washes his feet. And I'm telling you, that moment echoed through the heavens. Angels and demons took note and said, this is what God's doing. He sobbed the entire time. Because he, he understood what's happening. He's going, these are my brothers. These are my brothers. We're not the same. But we're united by something that is so much more powerful than our differences are. This has to be what the church does. The church is the only thing under heaven that can unite people. It's the only thing that can. Because you have to unite around something that's greater than your reasons to fight each other. So three things that I think come from this before we turn the page and, and next week begin the more practical section. And that is that, as we've been talking about, this, this, this uniting of things on earth that has impact in things on heaven, in heaven. The, the mission of God is global. It's to the ethnos, and it always has been. Now, this is a drum that I beat all the time because I'm the mission pastor here, but I can't tell you, and forgive yourself if you're one of them, because it's many of you guys, how many times people have been like, well, I'm not called to global missions. I understand some of this is just semantic, but let me just say, if you are a Christian, it's not a choice. You are called to global missions, because the mission is global. Now, you can breathe a sigh of relief, because I don't think you all have to sell your stuff and move to Africa. That's not what I'm saying but you are called to global missions. The question is, how are you called to global missions? Are you called to be a supporter, a sender, somebody who is plugged in through prayer or through support in a practical, material way? And here, if you, if you live here, you have to understand, for the first time in human history, the nations came to you. Many of you guys work alongside many nations. Many different people groups are represented in your workplaces, in your grocery stores, within your family. And so it, a lot of it is about a paradigm shift. It's about having a mindset that changes to see that, no, that the mission is global. The mission is to the nations, and the nations are right here. We stand on the shoulders of missionaries in the 18th and 19th centuries who packed their belongings in coffins to ship them to where they were going to be missionaries because they knew they would die there. When I go on a short-term missions trip, I can Skype my wife and daughter. The world has changed, and some of it is for the better, because you guys, I'm telling you, the global mission field is, is in your backyard right now. And so see it that way. See your role in it. The second one, and this is honestly the most important, is, is that unity in the church, and specifically unity across divides that have great strife historically, whether that be ethnic, gender, socioeconomic, fill in the gap. Unity within the church between those people is paramount. It's not a side issue. It's not a nice, happy side effect when that happens to happen in the church. Paul says this is what the church is supposed to be doing. And that means that prejudice is poison. That racism is poison to the church. 
that anything that lets you see a fellow Christian and think that you are on a different standing than them because of something about you is just deadly and we have to get it out. Again, it doesn't mean we erase or pretend that differences aren't there. It just means that those differences stand down in the presence of the king of kings that we serve. And so that means knowing each other, loving each other, caring about each other, and seeing that there is something greater than all of us that we all unite on. I see this in like the tiniest, most kind of, and we'll talk about this in a couple weeks, but within my own marriage, I see this in a micro level where my wife and I, we've had times where we're fighting and the thing that gets me to kind of flip the switch and realize that I don't want to fight anymore is a recognition of the fact that we have the most important things in the world in common. Like whatever our disagreements are right now, we both believe the same things about the universe and about who's in charge of it. This is what the church has to do at a giant zoomed out level. And so with humility, let me just tell you that if within the church you are letting your political loyalties cause you to treat individuals who have been saved by the same grace and the same blood that you have been saved by differently, if you're letting politics supersede your love for your brothers and sisters in the church, then something has gone terribly wrong. And I just want to ask you to look at that again, to look at it again. Because unity within the body of Christ is what bears witness to God's manifold wisdom. And when we are prejudiced and when we are ununified, it is bearing false witness about God's character and wisdom in the heavens. It is not a small thing. It's not a side issue. And when it's done right, the world and the heavens can look at the church and see how is it that they're able to unify when we can't? And the answer is Jesus. It's like the best Sunday school answer ever, Jesus. And finally, and this is what it kind of all wraps around, it's recognize that if you're a Christian, your identity fundamentally is rooted in Christ. And so you become a part of that new humanity that Paul talked about last week. You become a part of that new man that's been made out of two. It's it, like involvement with the capital C church is not optional in Christianity. It's automatic. You're in automatically. And it's who you are. It's the most important thing about you. When all of your other affiliations have one day passed away, when there are no TV shows and sports teams and political parties and nation states, when all of them are gone, you will be united forever with your brothers and sisters in Christ. And so let's start having that loyalty take front and center now. You have more in common with the African Christian in a village in the middle of nowhere in Tanzania than you do with your next door neighbor who doesn't know Jesus. That's just true. That's your brother. That's your sister. And so a lot of this is us taking off the shackles of our world and our culture and saying, I am united by the blood of Jesus to the other people in this room. Do you guys know how many people in the room right now you would have nothing to do with if it wasn't for Jesus? How beautiful is that? And how many of you guys would, would hang out with me if it wasn't for Christianity? I'm looking for a show of hands. And, and, uh, <laughs> they, all right, cool. Thank you, Jenny. <laughs> but you, you know what I'm talking about. This is a room filled with disparate people and peoples who, if it wasn't for the blood of Jesus, would not be together in the same room. And that is a beautiful thing that I think truly does bear witness in heaven and on earth to God's wisdom. And so let's try to reframe our identities away from these other lesser worldly things that we define ourselves by and center it around Jesus. He's the only thing that can carry that kind of weight. He's the only thing that can unify people who have a lot of reasons to dislike each other. The ushers are going to pass out communion. And I want to look at the end of the story. Because like I said, Acts 2, Acts 2 is, is a beachhead. This is a moment where... Um, where the kind of undoing of Babel happens in a dramatic, immediate way in Jerusalem. But it's just a paradigm for how the church is supposed to move forward. But at the end of time, there's an image in Scripture that, uh, that John sees in the, in the book of Revelation that, that is the goal. This is what history is headed towards. This is what's going to happen. Revelation 7 says, After this I looked, and behold, 
a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Every nation from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before what? The throne of Jesus. This is a picture of the end of time. God wants a people constituted from every tribe, tongue, and nation, and it's going to happen. And the church is invited to become participants in that work starting now. It's a beautiful picture. Every time I read this passage, I think of my friends from Tanzania and Nigeria and Haiti and Cuba and Cambodia, and, and um, I think man, one day we'll all be together standing there, bringing our best before God. That's a huge part, by the way, of why we don't ignore the differences between us. The, the way the Bible talks about it, it's, it's the people's coming together to bring their own beautiful, unique contributions before God. It's not a flattening or a homogenization of peoples. It's, it's all of them bringing their best. And that's what you want, right? I mean, a new creation, you want everybody's food to be there, right? I mean, at the very least, right? We, wanna, we want everyone at the table. And so we have this family meal. And in the early church, it was literally a meal. They would sit down and eat a meal together. And this communion ceremony would be a part of it. And it's so essential. It's the reason why we do it week after week is because we have to be firmly rooted in what it is that is the most important thing about us. The reason that you can unite and take this bread and this cup next to someone who has nothing in common with you is because of the act in history that this stands for. It's because Jesus took all of the hostility onto himself and died with it to bring you to God and to bring us to each other. And so as we take this, I want to encourage you, think of it as a family meal. Think of it as the thing around which we unify and rally. You guys know how it is. Sometimes you have a meal with someone and, it, and stuff just feels different when you're eating together. <laughs> this is the thing that unites us. It's the death and resurrection of Jesus. And may all divisions and differences and struggles and fighting wither and fade away before the Son of God. Let's stand together. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Do it in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup and said, this is my blood poured out for the remission of sins for a new covenant. And that's a new covenant that all peoples and every tribe, tongue, and nation is invited into. Father, you know how that fragmentation runs right through the middle of my own heart and that I'm not somebody who just automatically gets it and is so open-minded and, and finds it so easy to reconcile with people I disagree with and have problems with. It's not, Lord, I, that's not how it is. But I am so convinced that you want us within the church to rally around your son such that our divisions fade into the background. Lord, I pray that you would help us to eliminate all of these line-drawing habits that we have to separate ourselves from each other. That you would help us to see that the things that we have in common are infinitely more important, infinitely more important than the things that we have that are different. And let the church, Lord, in South Valley, as one expression of that, bear witness to your multifaceted wisdom in heaven and on earth. Thank you that your death for us accomplished what is necessary for us to come into your kingdom to be your sons and daughters. Help us to look around the room and see brothers and sisters first and foremost. We love you. We look forward to the day when we'll stand together with people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And in the meantime, we want to model that. So help us. Help us, Lord. It's hard. We love you. In Jesus' name. Amen. We'll have prayer counselors who will be here at the front if you need. Oh, thank you. <laughs> a smattering is the worst amount of applause, by the way. Um, we'll have uh, folks up here at the front who can pray for you. If you need prayer for anything, have a wonderful week. Enjoy the game.